You know, since the dawn of time, probably since the first art was created by the human, two things have been major questions. The first is, what tool do I use? And the second is, how do I get good fast? And I think these are integral problems that we strive to deal with as artists. What I want to do in this podcast is unpack the idea of what actually makes us improve quickly and how the tools sort of interplay with that and interact with the idea of learning and how to get good. I think there are a lot of traps here if we get lost in oscillating between different tools, different techniques, different ideas. It's easy to lose your way and lose a lot of energy and momentum in your journey towards becoming the type of artist that you want to be. What I'll do is unpack this concept of how the tools relate to getting good, how the tools relate to the speed of adaptation of your learning, and also give you a few really super practical tips and sets of advice and frameworks that you can use to make sure that you are using tools to the best of their ability so that they serve you. Welcome to this podcast style show. My name is Tim McBurney. I've been a professional working artist for over 20 years and a lot of that time has actually been spent, you know, mentoring and teaching students either in a university environment where I'm teaching hundreds of students a year how to draw, how to get better, how to do it fast or either just one-on-one -on -one helping people through these struggles and understanding how to get good quickly and what tools to use. Now, this is a little bit of an experiment. This is the first episode that I'm doing of a podcast show, which is just an opportunity for me to talk about art more in the sort of intellectual um, sort of word realm, right? So on the Drawing Codex channel where I teach drawing and it really is just all about drawing and art and line and color illustration and comics and manga, etc. Here, what I want to do is unpack a lot of the ideas that go into productivity uh, again, the theoretical side of being an artist, potentially some things around sort of how to make money, how to freelance as an artist, etc. But I really like the idea of doing a show uh, about visual stuff that is sort of not visual because I think that way you can listen to it while you draw or, you know, while you're doing something else. So that's the goal here. So hopefully the, the idea here is either you're doing something else or you're drawing, but we're going to sort of learn about art, um, how to get good at art, how to be productive, how to be efficient how to become professional artists or, you know, just really, really good hobby artists, whatever you want to do. Now, this idea of tools, as I said, I think really is something that harkens back to the earliest aspirations of humankind. Um, I can easily imagine the first people who are doing cave painting uh, have two questions, right? The first is, what paint are you using? How do you do that? And the second is, uh, how do I do it and how do I get good at it? fast. Um, now, I think that a big part of this is really about simplifying your tool set. And that's what I'm going to sort of unpack here is the idea of the tools and how they relate to speed specifically. Now, keep in mind, again, this is coming from someone who has spent a lot of time mentoring people. I've seen a lot of stuff right out in the real world. This is not necessarily theoretical. These are all sort of ideas that we've sort of put to the test, right? And I've seen lots of different um, approaches and things that people try, traps people tend to fall into. Um, and I'm in a situation, you know, now where like, look, I, I can buy any tool I want, right? If it's really going to help my art. Um, the idea of simplicity is not necessarily one of frugality or of, um, you know, hey, you know, don't worry about, you know, the fancy tools that some professional artist is using. Uh, you just need these kind of little, you know, plebeian tools, right? Just sort of go back in your corner and, 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 and learn to draw with a pencil. I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. And it's a lot more important than that for your uh, artistic journey to understand how the tools really relate to what you're doing. So I really want to start this um, exploration with this concept of what tool do you use? And this is something that I think we all have this desire to learn what the tools our favorite artists 
use. Um, and, you know, the, the classic example is that people will come up to a comic book artist at a convention, you know, some professional, really amazing comic book artist. And they're just going to ask this question, like, what pencil do you use? And I think this is just one of these sort of primal conversations that I think is really important to have as artists is like, does that matter? And I can remember doing this. I remember, uh, you know, really being a fan of, uh, you know, comic book artists such as Joe Matt back when he was drawing battle chases. And this was sort of highly energetic, um, you know, sort of really manga inspired. One of the first kind of real sort of manga um, US Western sort of fusion styles that I think was really working. And I just kind of wanted to know how he did everything. And I would just, you know, you you'd literally be looking through interviews in magazines, trying to search for like, okay, which, which pencil is it? Like, oh, it's like a three H lead. Like what brand is it? Oh, it's not a brand. It's like this thing. And like, what's the lead holder? And then like, you know, you'd see people do stuff like uh, a lot of, you know, artists end up modifying their tools. You, you kind of say, hey, just use a pencil kit. Um, but they end up modifying that tool. They end up, uh, you know, wrapping tape around it or, you know, putting some sort of, you know, modification to it to make it easy to hold. And, you know, you'd be looking at that as a young artist saying like, oh, is that it? Is that the trick? Is that what matters? Right. And, um, you know, I think obviously the answer that most people give you is like, no, look, it doesn't, um, it doesn't matter. Right. I think one of the best quotes I sort of heard on this is that, look, if you can draw, you can draw with a burnt stick on a brown paper bag. And I think that's sort of true, but it's also important to consider the tool because the tool is how we interact with the art. So, you know, another example of like sort of searching for tools that I, you know, had is that, uh, you know, when comics started to be colored digitally, uh, I'd sort of see them in the in the newsstand and I'd sort of be picking them up. And I think me and my friend in high school, um, you know, we're just sort of sitting there thinking like, how do they do this? How do they get the colors so flat? How do they get these gradients in there? How do they how do they make it look so clean? And we tried everything. We tried. I tried watercolor. I tried poster color. I tried gouache. I tried acrylic. I tried like everything you could think of. And I think, um, you know, it was really later on that we kind of realized that they were doing this with a computer. And at that point in time, this was sort of the mid nineties, that was inconceivable, right? Because we didn't, you didn't, no one was really doing that. Um, but I think we found some sort of really good Japanese, like step-by-step -step magazines that, uh, you know, showed this process and we were like, oh my you know, they're doing it digitally and these are, these are the programs. Uh, and, and so that's sort of what we did. And that's actually the genesis for how I sort of got into digital art really early is I was just looking at comic books and, and sort of being like, how do they do this? And, uh, you know, it was done in Photoshop. And so that's why I learned Photoshop. Now, I think there's something really important there because I think that impulse to search for the right tool is actually completely valid. And I think as an artist, you are, it is well within your right. And it will certainly help you to, you know, figure out what tools your favorite artists are using and, you know, use that as a good directional guide, right? Like you want to be using the same kind of tools that your favorite artists are. And again, we'll circle a little bit back to that um, because I think there's a couple of really important takeaways there. But the problem is that if you've done this, you find that the tool doesn't make a difference, right? I would use a 3H pencil in a lead holder and I would put tape on it and I'd do all the things. And it obviously wouldn't make me draw better and it wouldn't make me draw like the artist who I was really admiring. Similarly, uh, we ended up, you know, buying computers, uh, you know, one of the really early sort of uh, Bondi Blue iMacs and getting Photoshop 3 and playing around with it and trying to figure it out. And it, it's a lot harder than it looks. It, it, it's sort of, it, it's like we're in the right area, but something was missing. And the thing that's missing is us. And I think that really is the lesson here that people are trying to get across with that idea of, look, if you can draw, you can draw with a burnt stick on a brown paper bag. That's true. But again, the tools do matter. But it's important to understand, uh, you know, obviously at the outset that the thing that's going to change, the thing that is going to improve and the thing that you need to improve 
to get yourself better quicker is you. So really the task is your learning. The tool helps, but what you're trying to do is actually improve your understanding, your foundation, your craft, your relationship to drawing or painting or sculpture or whatever it may be. That's the thing that actually gets better over time. It's how you utilize the tool and it's your knowledge of the tool and the way that you can employ it sophisticatedly to create amazing things. Now, I think the other aspect to this, the other facet to this is that there is something really important about a simple set of tools or a simple tool in and of itself, a simple methodology or process for creating art. And I think this is, again, the other element that you really have to consider here is that often what happens with that seeking of a different tool is that you find the tool, you use it, and it's maybe not going to do what you want. And certainly this happened to me is that I would, again, find a tool, I'd find a thing, and I'd try, I'd try that particular 3H lead in a lead holder. And I could kind of see how it was maybe going to make me, you know, draw like that person. Like there was an element of that particular pressure on the paper that would kind of get that result. But, you know, most of what would happen and what I see with students is that we oscillate. We meander instead of kind of saying, oh, okay, look, I've got the tool. This is what I need. I just need to learn how to use it. We're we're often drawn to try out different tools to experiment. And I think that the sort of, you know, just the traditional high school education um, and a lot of sort of university education, even around art, does put a big emphasis on emphasis on materials, right? And learning different materials, you know, doing swatches with all the different pencils and all this kind of stuff and trying out different things. And there's certainly validity to that. But I think really at the core of, you know, understanding and getting good at a tool is what you want to do is pick a very, very limited number of tools and you need to learn to use them in a very, very deep and fundamental way. You need to go really, really deep in depth and understand the very, very subtle subtle intricacies of how that particular tool works. And it's that knowledge, that deeper knowledge that will actually help you apply to different mediums. So, you know, going really deep with, you know, maybe watercolor uh, might actually help you with a different medium because you take with you that knowledge of the the fact that there is intricacy to that tool, to that medium, to that set of paints and, you know, the way you apply them, the way they interact with the paper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is exactly the same with digital, right? You, you know, understand how to use Photoshop um, really well. That's going to make it very, very easy for you to use Procreate, uh, Clip Studio, whatever. These things are actually very similar. They have small differences, but it's the depth of knowledge that allows us to actually much more easily adapt to new tools. So what you want to try and practice is the idea of simple tools and a simple small tool set. And I think this is ironically a big part of the advice that you'll actually get. And it's really just a matter of contextualizing that advice to your exact journey. So I think that most people are going to say, hey, look, just don't worry about that. Just, you know, use a pencil. Just use this. You know, don't worry about the the tools and the techniques. Just focus on you. Um, again, I think that's true, but it really is also a matter of finding out exactly which tools you need to go deep on. So let's take uh, another sort of good example of a limited set of tools. Um, this is something that's often applied in the traditional painting world and the, you know, digital painting world as, as well is the idea of a limited palette. You know, one of the most famous kind of limited palettes is the, the Zorn palette, which was, uh, again, sort of made famous by Anders Zorn, who was a, you know, painter, I think, in sort of the late um, 1800s, and a really, really amazing painter. And he, the, the, the palette is kind of, you know, typically is said to have consisted of four colors. And it's essentially a, um, a, a yellow, a, a red, and a black and a white. Now, there's specific types of, uh, you know, what those colors are, and the specific chemical ways that they would interact would probably allow you to have 
you know, maybe a, a better range than if you just picked any yellow, red, white, or black. Um, you know, I suspect a lot of the blacks and whites are maybe a little bit cooler so that when you're mixing them with those warm colors, you have a good opportunity to get some sort of cooler grays um, that might sort of end up looking like blues, for instance. But um, I think, again, that the, the traditional palette is... Uh, is sort of yellow ochre, a vermilion, um, and I think sort of ivory black and sort of lead white or titanium white or something like that. I don't know a lot about painting, but uh, again, this is a very, very strong idea. And the concept there is a good metaphor for how this works because often what we're doing when we're painting and using color is we're dealing with learning how to represent the world on this two-dimensional frame. Now, if you just kind of squeeze, you know, sky blue um, and grass green onto the canvas, uh, again, what you'll find is that's actually quite an advanced technique to get that to work. You know, I, I know a lot of artists who are really, really quite good at using these primary colors. And one of the things I notice is, is it's actually quite hard to do it well and keep it subtle. Often what you're doing with painting is dealing with the relativity of color where you're trying to actually make something feel more or less green and you know you're working with uh, temperature contrast uh, complementary color contrast you know the best the, the best example of this is that you know if you really want a forest to look green you, you you're well advised to put a little bit of red in it right a little bit of warmth because that will make the green pop more right because again you have your red green complement so these are the ideas you're playing with and the the limited palette helps you to understand this because it it sort of makes you focus on warm and cool and how to say look I need something that looks blue but I don't have a blue and I might not actually want a blue because if I can create the feeling of coolness the feeling of um again that sort of blueish gray color and I can emphasize it by putting a lot more reds and yellows around it, then I'm actually going to have a much more harmonious image because there's no actual sort of blue cool color there. And again, this will typically give you a more sort of homogenous, um, you know, nice feeling image. And it's these skills that, again, once you do add more colors to your palette, and it's not as if Zorn was some kind of, you know, limited palette, zealot i assume um i think it's well understood that he would use different colors if he needed to but it's this idea of simplicity as both a good way to learn in the beginning because it sort of make, makes that it, it means that as an artist you, you're not worrying about do i suck because i don't have this color or that color you suck because you're not learning how to sort of combine colors properly and if you can't combine these limited set of colors properly it's unlikely that adding more is really going to help and also that you can easily see how good your ability is to create relative color so you're learning a lot of things by using a simple color palette it's also important to understand that as you progress as an artist as you get better as you get to the higher levels of sort of skill that these simple things can actually help again, to fine tune and, and get that last one or 2% out of your understanding of how to use all the colors. So it's often something that we employ as sort of artists who are more advanced to kind of go back to the basics and say, like, you know what, I, I've gone too complicated. I need to just simplify things, focus on the basics again, remember all these little nuances, see, you know, what the new things that I've learned after trying, you know, more techniques and different things once you really master the basics. Then you go back and you restrict to those sort of simple sets of tools and you realize again that there's more to learn from using a simple set of tools. It enhances your ability overall. It's a really good way to hone in on what's important and what you're good at and bad at. And when you are trying to get that last, you know, 10, 5, 2, 1% of improvement, it's very hard and you often have to do this where you limit yourself and that actually highlights and brings up new opportunities for learning and growth. And, you know, that can mean, again, you get, you know, half a percent better in a year as opposed to, you know, a quarter of a percent better in a year, which is really, really important. Again, if you've been doing this for 30, 40 or 50 years. 
Now, let's turn that on its head a little bit and see if we can shake out a little bit more information by understanding that, again, this idea of limitation can be taken a little bit too far. So one of the things that often sort of happens is if you hear this kind of, uh, you know, it's almost like, a, again, like a restrictive uh, deprivation mindset when it comes to tools and things. And I think it can feel a bit high and mighty, right? It can feel like, again, people are kind of saying, hey, yep, go, go back in your box, back in your corner, you know, just sit there and draw with a pencil for 10 years and then come and talk to me, right? And then I'll give you some more information. But there is an aspect of that. And I think what I have seen in these sort of traditional schooling environments, again, a little bit of background, I'm mostly self-taught. Uh, I, I sort of taught myself how to draw. There just wasn't a lot of opportunity for me to do it any other way. I used a lot of online resources. As soon as online resources became available, like you could buy a DVD from someone and see an actual person who was a real professional drawing, I did that immediately. And that just changed my life, right? Which is a big reason why I'm sort of, you know, uh, here, you know, talking about these things because I, I think it's really important. Now, I have also spent a lot of time in these traditional university environments teaching drawing. And I've heard lots of stories about how a lot of these things happen. And, you know, for instance, you know, a classic thing that's often uh, going to happen in a, a high-end art college is, you know, you go to learn art. And the first year is just black and white. It's just tone. And it's basically like, nope, you know, you you cannot pass go. You cannot collect $200. You cannot use color because you don't, you don't understand tonality. Uh, you don't understand value, um, how light functions. And it's really most, it, it's important to do that first. Now, this is, again, a similar thing where we're restricting the medium, we're restricting the range of expression, we're restricting the tools to a certain degree, or in that case, I assume there's a wide range of tools that are used for tonality. But either way, I think um, for a lot of people, this can turn them off. And it's important to understand that these ideas sound fun, but they are based on an educational modality that is trying to corral a group of people with a curriculum and get them to a particular point. Right. And again, I've designed curriculum for this sort of stuff before. And I have a pretty good understanding of kind of, you know, the, the goals and the outcomes people are normally dealing with. So for a lot of people, that's going to work. I think that's a very effective technique, right? It's restrictive to all the things we're saying. Um, you know, don't go here, don't go there, just focus on this. The problem is that as artists, we're individual. And as an artist, you may be someone who lives and breathes color. And even though it is beneficial for you, to go through a year of tonal study and, you know, have to do the, the ABCs of art, as it were, to, you know, earn your stripes before you progress. I think that unless you're actually in that environment and you respond well to that environment, which are two things. One is you're in there. So you have the, you know, $300,000 it costs to go to one of these art colleges, um, uh, you know, again, in the United States and, you know, might it's still going to be expensive, you know, no matter where you are in the world, I, I think. And secondly, you actually, you know, um, you're someone who responds well to that, right? Not everyone actually thrives in those conditions. And again, um, I, I know this because I've seen a lot of students go through this and just it's not going to work for everyone. So I think um, it's a great idea, but it's important to understand that as artists, you're an individual and with the new paradigms of learning that are sort of happening, you can really go and get a lot closer to understanding you know, how to learn from someone who's actually doing what you're doing as opposed to, you know, these sort of more generalized artistic um, sort of teaching modalities. And um, apologies, that's a little bit of sort of like an abstract rambling um, sort of set of ideas. But the key here is you don't have to go to school and you may not like to go to school and be forced to do it a particular way, even though that is the best way or it's a very good way more likely you're sitting around trying to learn these things on your own or you're going to one of these art colleges but you actually um, want to do something different and you want to learn color on your on the side and for a lot of people again you know they live and breathe color color is why they do art and they're not 
so interested in tonality. They don't want to be tonalist sort of artists. Um, they might not even want to necessarily be representational artists. They might still want to work professionally, but you might want to, you know, express things differently. Um, you might be more interested in, again, a lot of the iconographic, um, you know, pictorial style imagery that is, uh, you know, going to surround comics, manga, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and these are things, again, I talk about a lot. So, this idea of, you know, restriction for restriction's sake is not necessarily, I think, um, beneficial. So I, I'm, and I'm doing that to just distance myself and what I'm saying a little bit from that idea. I think it's more important to understand that you kind of want to get close to the tools that you're going to use. And then you really want to hone down and figure out what are the real basics? What are the building blocks of your craft? of the thing that you really want to do. So what I want to do lastly is unpack this idea of how do we sort of get close to this sort of set of tools that might be working for you and why is that important? I think the number one reason that it's important is if you're not in a traditional educational system where you have someone cracking the whip, they have a perfectly designed curriculum that is based on tonality or some other paradigm for how they're going to get you to go through this kind of arc of understanding fundamentals, um, you know, self-expression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have someone cracking the whip and forcing you through that and understanding the, the things that you are particularly going to go through when you're going through that curriculum, um, and they're not good at it. They're not really good. You know, a lot of these things, are, you need to gel with the teacher. You need to want to be there. All these things need to happen. The most important thing that is going to make you get better fast is that you want to do this, that you're enjoying it, that you're engaged, that you're kind of doing the stuff that you want to do. And so that's why I think if you're not going through one of these systems and you're trying to figure out how to learn, you kind of have to get closer to the thing that you're passionate about in the beginning. And I think it's well worth sort of learning and understanding those tools. And to a certain degree, we can feed in those ideas of, you know, tonalism, how to get better at this, how to get better at that um, as we progress. Again, with the understanding that the key idea, the key ideology, the key trick to that idea of just starting tonally is that, again, you're just restricting what you can do. You're controlling your variables. It's just a very simple idea, but it's very effective. You can do that too, right? It's just very, very easy. Just don't get sort of caught up in the, you know, buying a million brush packs, just, you know, find a few brushes and use them. It's very simple. So I want to, again, unpack what that might look like. So maybe take a few examples. We can take some sort of drawing, uh, maybe some sort of inking, like comic book style work, some painting, some sort of sculpture. And I'll just give you a little bit of a framework so you can understand where I'm coming from. And again, a lot of this is based on experience, talking to people who are, you know, learning and, and progressing through these systems of understanding uh, themselves. So, you know, you might take the example of graphite, right? You're just pencil on paper. We can call it graphite, you can call it charcoal, you can call it whatever you want. You're just sort of drawing, right, with, with an implement on paper. So a good example of this would be, again, that there's a wide variety of ways that you can put the graphite on the paper. You can use different pencils, um, different grades of pencil. You can shave the pencil off. You can smudge it around. You can add talcum powder to the you know shaved pencil smudging stuff to make it smoother. Um, you can mask that off. You can use different paper. You can do a wide variety of things. There's a huge number of erasers you can get. Um, you know, should you get them all? Should you get an electric eraser? Should you get an electric pencil sharpener, etc., etc., etc. You know, people even often use water with graphite, right? So, lots of techniques. All these things are valid, right? N nothing, nothing here is an invalid technique. But, for instance, if you look at the technique of getting a gradient with a pencil. Right. So, you know, you have a, a, a typical sort of pencil. And the question is, how do you get a gradient with that? Well, if you look at an advanced technique, that might, again, be a matter of shaving it off and using a tissue or using some sort of, uh, you know, cotton bud device, making some tools to kind of smudge it everywhere, um, making that smooth. But you could also just say, well, if you just have the pencil and the paper, you have to be more creative to figure out how to actually get that happening. And I think a lot of this is about not just understanding the, 
you know, the, the obvious nature of like, look, you are controlling variables and obviously you're going to get better at these tools. But also a big part of what makes an artist an artist is the creativity, is responding to what's happening and thinking, how can I get the thing in my head to happen? Or how can I change what's on the page? How can I modify? How can I be in flow? How can I not necessarily step out and have to intellectually say, oh, what tool do I use? A big part of that, again, is just being in flow with the tool you have in your hand. And that idea of whatever you have in your hand being, you know, the most important thing, because you can then just quickly do something. So, a big part of you know what will make you a good artist is your creativity and your ability to finesse and use any tool in a very very sort of sophisticated way so you know a better thing might be to figure out how you actually create a gradient with that pencil uh, without shaving it off or doing anything fancy because what in my experience, you tend to find with sort of students is they they do the technique, you know, they mask things off, they, you know, uh, you know, shave all the pencil lead, you know, make a nice sort of paste of uh, talcum powder and, and pencil and, uh, you know, smooth it on. It still looks not very good because, again, there's a lot of finesse in all of those steps. There's a lot of artistry in all of those steps. And what we're needing is fine motor control for cutting the mask, for figuring out where the mask goes, for holding the mask down, for how much you know graphite you put in, how do you shave it exactly, how does that work? What pressure do you have with the you know cotton pad? Um, you know how exactly do all these things work? So a big part of what's happening is you're just multiplying the ways that you can suck, right? You're multiplying the ways that you're sort of lack of hind-eye coordination, your basic sort of how do I put the pencil on the paper, how much pressure, what direction does it go, um, you know, what rhythm, you know, what stroke, are you, are you sort of lifting the pencil off the page with every stroke properly, are you able to do that quickly? All of these things are things that are going to help you with each step of those advanced techniques. And there's just an underlying creativity and sophistication with every single thing you do when you're attacking a problem like this. Every thing you do is going to need a very high level of sophistication, hand-eye coordination, um, careful attention, and persistence, and patience, and practice. And you need to understand that and understand that adding complexity to a technique like that is not necessarily going to be the thing that teaches you how to create a good picture on the page. You do the technique, you mask stuff out, you create a nice gradient. It'll be better than you could do by hand, just doing it without all of those things, just by trying to create a gradient with a pencil on a bit of paper. It'll be better than that. But you won't be any better than that. You will have just learned 20 different techniques poorly. And I think in the beginning, you're much better off understanding and practicing and getting in the flow of creativity with how you manipulate a single tool well. Because what you find is that will carry over and make your ability to execute all these other techniques um, better. So that's the basic idea. And a good example, if we sort of look at something like graphite, right? Super simple uh, explanation. If we take the example of painting, right? We can look at, again, that classic idea of the Zorn palette of a limited palette being a really good way to help you understand color. Again, if you're trying to get the something to look blue, um, if you're trying to look, get something to look really red, Often what's happening is that we're seeing something in the world. We're seeing a vibrancy. We're seeing an energy. We're seeing a color um, sort of harmony, something that's really exciting. Uh, and what we're trying to do is replicate that. And what you tend to find is uh, that, you know, if you're trying to make something red, you know, just putting more red on there won't do it. That there's a point where we need to consider the gestalt, the entire painting, the entire experience, the entire viewing experience. And that often it's a matter of not just painting the thing that you want to be really vibrant and red, red, but considering what's around it. And maybe not all of the thing is red, only a little bit of it is red to really give it that sense of vibrance. So, you know, it's a matter of is it red in the highlights? Is it red in the shadows? All of these concepts. 
they're all coming down to this idea of how do I make a particular feeling? How do I get a particular emotion onto the page? And you have your tools that allow you to do that. Again, the simple idea of just squeezing more paint onto the onto the canvas it isn't going to do it. You need to understand the way all these colors interact, the way the eye works, um, the way our human perception works. And that's where a limited palette will actually teach you that. You need to consider these things. It, it kind of means that the window for success is smaller, but your opportunity for learning is infinitely greater. And again, I think that's a always a classic example of how a limited set of tools will allow you to advance quickly um, and quickly both because you're not spending time buying more paint, figuring out what colors of paint to buy. Um, you know, you're not wasting time actually, you know, putting them on the palette. You're thinking about the ones that you do have and how to blend them, how to mix them, how they contrast. And it's that thought process that you're actually going to use even if you have a million colors to use. Speaking of a million colors, I think one of the biggest problems that we have in digital art with digital painting is there's often too many colors. So I think these ideas of limiting your palette can actually be really helpful digitally as well because it's very easy to just kind of put more red on there. And uh, again, it just doesn't really do it. Another really obvious example here when we're talking about digital is that digitally you have a free, unlimited, almost, you know, set of tools. Uh, you, again, you can buy brush packs, you can buy stuff. The software costs money. But once you're kind of there, there's no real penalty to getting a different brush. So I think a lot of what I see students doing is, again, just buying brush packs or finding brush packs or sort of being like, what what is the brush? And the real frustration and what you'll find most sort of advanced artists and teachers sort of think is that, uh, again, the brush doesn't matter, right? It's really not about the brush. It's about your understanding of, again, tonality, um, value, where's your light source, um, what colors you're using, what's your color theory, what's the intent behind your image, can you draw, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things I really found is that it's not just that that's true, but that even for me, what I found is that, again, going simpler has allowed me to really understand how painting works a lot better. Again, I'm mostly a comic book artist and I don't do a lot of painting, but but I have done uh, more than your average sort of uh, line and color artist. And I have a pretty good understanding of how it works. And I found that, again, what typically will help you improve is just using a very, very simple set of tools. If it's digitally, what I'd say is try and choose the smallest set of tools you possibly feasibly can. Your goal in the beginning should be to get it smaller and smaller. And I think the experimentation and the sort of advancement you have learning how to use those different tools um, can be really useful. As an example, I think one of the you know most underappreciated aspects of digital painting that beginners just uh, really struggle with is is, is the, the concept of masking, right? And just using in Photoshop or whatever sort of tool, again, the idea of lasso tool, uh, masks, how they function, especially in Photoshop where you can have very complicated sets of masking. And uh, it's often the case that you will look, because I know a lot of students will look at people who get very good at painting digitally in a way that feels very traditional and very loose and very free. And, and then you kind of see how it's actually done. And a lot of it is done with a very, very sophisticated, tricky, clever applications of selections and using layers and, and understanding how these things function. And it's it's actually just a simple tool, you know, just selection. How do you, then you can paint a hard edge and a soft edge, right? If you select one hard edge here um, and you can combine that selection with brushes and you can then just kind of paint your own masks and then you can paint with the brush in the mask in the masked off area. And all of these things are, again, what you're doing is you're applying creatively the same idea, right? Which is that I can create a mask and that means that this particular bit of the image is not gonna receive the brush stroke and this bit is. And if you just take that one idea, you just spin it and you repeat it again and again, you get really, really good at it. You find that that can be like a fundamental building block to what allows you to get a feeling, again, of sort of crisp edges, soft edges, lost edges, found edges. Again, these are simple concepts in painting that uh, you can't learn by just kind of spamming a whole bunch of brushes around or trying to find 
<clears throat> you know, a brush that is going to be good for hair or good for eyes or good for this, right? It, it's a matter of understanding how these things function at a primal level. And again, another example of how creativity is the thing that you're actually learning by using a simple set of tools. Another example here that I often sort of say is that, again, you're much better off just sticking with the simple round brush in Photoshop because there's a huge variety of modifications you can make to it. Mostly, you can just change the size of it and the opacity of it. So not just the Wacom's pressure sensitivity opacity, but you know you can literally just use the number keys to select what core opacity it has, right? And and it's just like these simple things that if you apply them and you understand, immediately allows you to create very very sophisticated blends, very sophisticated gradients with a round brush. And if you can do that with a round brush. It's a lot easier to then do it with a brush that is designed to create blends. So again, it's just simple application and understanding what the tool is actually capable of. And the restriction helps you to do that. Uh, it points out where your technique is lacking. Now, I really do think that these ideas are just universal for all sort of crafts and arts. Uh, when I was learning 3D, um, you know, trying to play around with ZBrush, etc., which is a 3D sort of sculpting application. It's these same things that I found really helped me to get better faster. And the speed here comes from not messing around with the, you know, millions of tools there. And what I found was that, again, I'd use all these different brushes and I'd see people doing these things in different tutorials. And uh, again, it's often easy to be overwhelmed by all these different options. And what I found was, again, just going back and having like one or two techniques or ideas, again, masking mixed with move, um, inflate, um, plus one or two simple brushes, either in ZBrush, it would be, you know, your kind of standard damn, damn standard brush, um, and maybe one of those ones that kind of will get you sort of a, a clean sort of mechanical surface or something. Again, you're after things that will affect a particular look, right? And if the thing that you're going for needs a particular tool, then obviously you choose that. But digitally, I think this is more important than anything else. You want to restrict the number of tools in the beginning as much as possible, and that will help you to get better quickly. A big question here is obviously how do you find out which artists that you're going to follow? Which set of simple tools do you need to create the type of art that you want? Now, you know, a good example of this would be if you are interested in comic books and maybe you like uh, manga art, uh, you know, it would be a good idea to just simply go and find out what most manga artists are using to get that look specifically. And I think there's a number of sort of very simple ways you can do this. One is to just go and ask someone who is obviously giving this type of advice. And I think a lot of people and a lot of people who are sort of advanced professionals will be more than happy to point out the obvious, which is like, look, all you need is this and this, just use this. And I think often that advice will be pretty good. If that advice is not there for you, right, um, you know, that you can search for it, just ask someone, right, like, hey, you know, like, which, which are the most important tools or techniques I should focus on in Photoshop, or, you know, for, for drawing manga, right, and, and people will probably be able to tell you. A really simple trick, again, if even that's not possible, right, is, uh, or maybe if you're a little bit confused, you're, you're sort of looking at things that are maybe more at the periphery, is just to consider, you know, what the general tools are of the artists that you like. So most people will kind of tell you this. Most people will have this on their website, again, because they're sick of people asking them. They kind of have these questions um, as a frequently asked question. And just look, you know, like what are the tools that most manga artists use? You know, you should be able to get a pretty good sort of effective answer to that, right? And you might come up with something like, you know, a standard G-Pen, which is just a sort of uh, nib, um, old school sort of nib pen um, that you kind of dip in ink. And uh, what you'll find is if you sort of contrast that, and I think this is a really, really important point here, is like if you contrast that idea of saying, I want to be a comic book artist, I want to understand how to, you know, create worlds with line, black and white. You know, you may be interested in, you know, Western comic book art. You might be a fan of, you know, the sort of uh, John Bursima, um, Al, Will Al Williamson, old school, um, you know, comic book art, right? Um, e even something maybe like, you know, Hal Foster, uh, Prince Valiant, uh, Flash Gordon, you know, these sort of older 
um, comic book styles, right? A lot of these were done with a brush. And what you'll find is, again, if you contrast that idea of, you know, how to get a particular look, if you want your art to look that way, if you want it to have that kind of brushed look, just go look at what they're using. And most of them are just inking with a brush. And if you sort of look at what most manga artists are using, most people are using a G pen or some type of sort of, you know, nib pen that you dip in ink um, again and again. And, uh, you know, it, it sort of gets uh, wears down and gets looser. And there's a lot of technique to both of these things, right? Um, you know, often people have multiple sort of pen nibs going at the same time because they give different lines. Uh, you know, some people have a, all sorts of techniques they use for exactly how to thin the ink, exactly how to blend the ink, um, you know, get the right mix of ink you want, then you got to sort of leave it out a bit so it gets a little bit sticky. There's, there's, there's depth to all those tools. But obviously, if you want a particular look for your art, you're going to need to get pretty close because there's no way you're going to be able to ink like John Buscema um, with the G-Pen. I mean, it is just not freaking going to happen, right? It doesn't matter how hard you try. Um, you know, this idea of, oh, if you can draw, you, you know, you can draw with a burnt, you know, stick on a brown paper bag. Well, not really. You can't you can't sort of um, ink a comic book like John Buscema with a G-Pen and you can't draw manga with a, a brush, right? It just has a different look. Again, it's not to say, you know, some people don't do manga with a brush, but if, if, if you're looking at the general style and you're like, oh, that's what I want, then um, again, just use those tools, but, you know, keep it simple. So again, that's a that's a really sort of simple uh, example there, and and I think it's uh, something that's well worth paying attention to. Is you do want to get pretty close because there's no point in going down some rabbit hole of, uh, look, this is how one should learn to draw. I'm gonna you know go back to the simplest because the simplest is always charcoal. It's always just like, look, we're gonna draw with graphite. Um, but again, if you want a particular look and you're in, you're in love with that look, you're passionate about that look, you need to find the set of tools, the simple sort of um, collection of things that really are at the core of making that particular look work. So obviously we haven't talked a lot about speed, but the idea here is that the more you focus on simplicity, the faster you improve. Now, you can improve by learning a whole bunch of different techniques, but that's not actually going to get you to get better. What we're looking for is how to make your ability to utilize tools and your ability to create the art you want. How do we improve the speed of that happening? And that really happens internally. That's where you just do it by learning. And I think that one of the things that will help you to do that the most is simple set of tools. It's easier to learn. And once you kind of learn the tools, that's when the real learning occurs. Anything that's going to leak energy out of your life, trying different things, playing around with different things, experimenting. Again, a lot of people find this fun. If you want to really get good at something, though, you need to focus. And that's where this idea of, you know, just picking something and going with it and going deep is the key to getting good fast. All right, so what I want to leave you with is just a simple framework, right, for a few things that you can sort of take away from this. The first is to look at, if we look at this from a few different angles, I think this might give us a good understanding of where we can go from here. If we look at this from an analytical scientific point of view, I think it's easy to see that you are controlling your variables. That's a very sort of fundamental scientific idea. Control the variables. Understand, look, if you if you learn the tools really well, you're not changing the tools, then the tools stay the same. Then you realize, oh, what's what needs improving is me. It's a lot easier to see which aspects of you need improving. And I think analytically, it's really easy to make that case on a scientific level. If you want the kind of, uh, you know, simple takeaway bro level of this, it's just keep it simple, stupid. Just simplicity is often the answer to a lot of things, right? It's no mystery that it sort of pops up here. So again, if you're just like, well, look, what, what, was, it, what was I talking about? Keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. And that will normally solve most problems. If we think about this from a question of what do you actually do? What do we do with this sort of set of information? I think if you're beginning, um, I think what I do is I really try and find and put effort into finding the simple set of tools that you want to use. This may take some experimentation. 
right? It's not necessarily a one shot thing. You don't need to feel like, oh, hey, you know, I need to pick these tools. And then, you know, anytime I have resistance to this, I need to just, you know, bite down on the mouthpiece and grit it out, right? And uh, I don't like this tool, but I need to learn how to use it anyway. There's certainly an interplay to that, but I think, you you know, you're a grown human. You can do the thinking yourself. The idea here is, you know, just don't keep swapping things and going, you know, searching for, you know, new fancy ways to do it, right? Just stick to something that you know is going to get the kind of effect you want. And, you know, once you kind of know, like, roughly the artists that you like, what kind of tools they're using, um, just stick to that. And, you know, if they give you a brush pack that's got, like, 20 Just kind of, you know, watch some of their tutorials, see which are the ones they use the most. And, uh, you know, then just try and learn those really well. And even if you might find, oh, hey, you know, it would be really good to do this thing with this brush or this technique or whatever. Just try and have in your mind a simple framework for how you can kind of solve those problems um, and use your creativity to try and solve them instead of like finding a different brush, right? So again, you know, using selections, um, a few select brushes, if you're working digitally, again, you might have a few brushes that give you the real look that you want. Um, Again, that's totally fine. Find the ones you love, find the ones that you really like, but at its core, understand that more is not necessarily going to help you get better. What you want to do is find a small set that you can stick with for a good amount of time. Now, if you are more experienced, I think this is where, again, one of the things that will help you get faster, quicker, is when you're trying to learn new skills. Again, if you're trying to learn 3D, if you're trying to get it better at painting, right? You know, for instance, I'm like a comic book artist, sort of line and color artist style person. And again, you know, often we want to, you know, play around with different ideas, different techniques. Um, It's all about, I think, trying to find exactly what I just said. Find the simple set of tools that are going to allow you to learn that sort of technique, medium, idea, um, hone them down and just focus on those. I think that's going to give you the fastest rate of adaptation. And hopefully you've mastered a few of these sort of different tools in your own sort of realm well. And I think that'll serve you really well to understand, again, how your creativity that you often use with your simple tools um, can apply to other simple tools. And I think that's where, again, that sort of cross interdisciplinary um, sort of learning can actually happen and be really, really useful. If we look at this from more of a sort of spiritual framework, right? I think it is important to understand that the simplicity and the calm that can happen with knowing that you can create your work with, again, a fairly limited set of implements is really beneficial. And it's important to understand that internally, the way that we grow is often through overcoming these challenges with our own creativity. And I think uh, learning about yourself and how you relate to the world is really, really useful. And also, you know, really getting deep with a craft, understanding the finer, finer details of a thing, I think allows us to appreciate the world in a much richer way. You see how everything is kind of built with this level of finesse. And, uh, you know, the more you kind of look at the world, the more you understand it, the more you appreciate it. So the idea of simplicity and craftspersonship and, again, understanding how all of these things interplay and how the world is made, how things are manufactured and your role in that, right? And, again, the fact that you are in a tradition of people who have been using simple tools for thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, I think, gives you a greater connection to what it is to be human. Okay, my last thought here is just... A really practical one. It's that if you focus on a very, very simple set of tools, you can avoid spending huge amounts of money on a wide variety of tools. I think this is good, again, if you don't have much money, or it can mean that you can spend more money on this simpler, narrower set of things that you're going to play with. And I think that what you'll find is the higher level of tools will allow you to go a little bit deeper. The more, you know, the better brushes behave a little bit better. They allow you to actually fine tune your relationship to them better. Um, You know, talking about traditional brushes. And I think that's, you know, just something that's worth mentioning, right? Um, I once bought basically every color marker that could be bought. I think, uh, you know, in, again, 
you know, around the late nineties, I probably spent fifteen hundred uh, Australian dollars on markers, and I bought every color because I was like, well, I don't really know what color I need. I'll just buy them all, and that'll be better. And I still have them, and I never used them at all uh, because, again, I just sort of went digital. And I think that's a good example of how, again, it's really just a matter of understanding that uh, what improves is us. Uh, the tools aren't really going to make that much of a difference. And it's better to engage in the, you know, what I would describe as like a healthy, um, puritanical sort of craft um, aspect and relationship to our tools and how we can do more with less less versus uh, just sort of engaging in retail therapy, right? Because retail therapy is really fun, but it doesn't make you better at art. And in most cases, it's going to slow you down. Anyway, that's all I've got for this one. Hopefully you've liked this sort of longer, um, more sort of podcast format of talk. Let me know in the comments below if you've ever bought some stupid art supplies that you never used, that you regret. Um, if you disagree or agree with this sort of general thesis, I'd be really sort of keen to hear your thoughts. Um, other than that, again, subscribe. This is a different channel. Subscribe, like, etc. That stuff sort of helps. Leave some reviews on podcast platforms, etc. And I'll catch you in the next one.